Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another edition of The Money Pros. I'm Oliver Tutt, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner, and I'll be your host for the next half hour as we talk about all the issues related to your money, how to make it, uh, and how to help it grow. So uh, stay with us as we uh, talk about all the issues uh, surrounding your finances. Let me give you an idea of what's up for today's show. First off, I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit of a disturbing trend, candidly. I've seen a lot of, uh, there's a study that came out. Uh, with respect to bankruptcy filings and how it's becoming more and more prevalent among seniors. And I've seen a lot of discussion on social media and a variety of other platforms uh, about this study, so I wanted to definitely touch on it uh, here on The Money Pros because I think it's an important trend to keep an eye on. Uh, shifting topics, we're going to be joined by our state planning pro, Lynn Riley from Cameron and Middleman. We're going to be talking about uh, the perils of a very common form of property ownership, and that's joint ownership. It's appropriate sometimes, a lot of other times it's not. We're going to be talking to Lynn about uh, some of the dangers and how to avoid them, so you're not going to want to miss that. In our third segment, we're going to be talking about uh, the world's first trillion dollar company. That's right, there's a U.S. corporation that crossed over the one trillion dollar uh, in value mark, and I think that's a notable uh, milestone in the history of stocks. We're going to want to talk about that. So, lots to get to on today's show. Let's jump right into it. And the first topic I want to talk about uh, is this uh, research was recently done on bankruptcy that uh, suggests that uh, bankruptcy is becoming more and more common uh, for uh, our seniors, and that is definitely a disturbing trend. So let's talk a little bit about the details. First of all, it was actually an academic research paper done by an organization called the Consumer Bankruptcy Project. So it wasn't a political organization. It was a uh, group of academic researchers. Uh, they released this uh, paper and a lot of new news organizations from NPR, Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Fox News, variety of organizations have uh, covered this story. Uh, but here are some of the, and I would also point out that this is an organization that researches bankruptcy on a yearly basis, so this was not a one-time event. This is the most recent study for 2017. And here are some of the statistics that they point out in the paper that alarmed uh, people who looked at it. The rate at which those that are 65 years old old or older have filed for bankruptcy has increased uh, two times since 2013. So the rate of bankruptcies among 65 plus year olds is up 100 percent since 2013 percent. 2.1 percent of filers were seniors in 1991. So if you go back to the 1991 figures, so we're going back a fair bit here, uh, 2.1 percent of bankruptcy filers were 65 years of age or older. Now that percentage is more than 12 percent. So more and more of bankruptcy filers are in that 65 plus age category. The average senior files for bankruptcy with over $17,000 in debt. So the question is, uh, is this a uh, distinct trend? Is it related to the graying of America? We know baby boomers are getting older. A larger portion of our population is in that category. So is that just a demographic trend uh, that's predictable? Or are there underlying issues with our economy and with what seniors are doing uh, that are uh, causing this, and is this something that uh, we should be alarmed about? Certainly, bankruptcy for seniors is an alarming trend because unlike somebody who perhaps declares bankruptcy uh, in their 30s or 40s and has an opportunity to recover from that, uh, employment situation changes, income goes up, uh, things along those lines where they can uh, recover from that, it's certainly much more difficult for a senior. So let's take a look at some of the possible reasons why this is occurring that's, that have been pointed out by commentators as well as the paper itself. So we'll put this up. Uh, first of the possible reasons, rising health care costs. This is something we talk about on the show all the time, but the reality is health care costs are going up at a rate far in excess of the rate of inflation, uh, and seniors uh, don't have as much ability to keep pace with those rising uh, health care costs. Things like increased co-pays, co everything from prescription drugs to long-term care costs, uh, costs rising dramatically. And this is a chief cause uh, for bankruptcies, particularly among seniors. Number two reason that's been postulated by a lot of people is simply inadequate savings. The reality is that the average American, 65 to 74 years old, has only about $358,000 saved for retirement. Um, 
So savings is critical in retirement because that's the thing that's going to prevent you from living on a fixed income. Other sources of income, whether they be pensions or Social Securities, come in at relatively fixed dollar amounts. It's your personal savings that's going to allow you to adjust for changes in the cost of living. And those seniors that don't have that personal savings are really in jeopardy of uh, financial distress and in some cases bankruptcy so it puts a lot of distress on fixed incomes uh, number three reason that I want to talk about decline in pensions this is another thing we've talked about under the money pros quite a bit the the American pension has really gone by the wayside but for all but just a few people uh, state employees government employees in some cases uh, but the elimination of pensions has affected a lot of workers have been replaced by the 401k which is a self-saving device for the most part and really tends to benefit higher income higher wage workers so uh, that is certainly impacting seniors and finally uh, number four reason a decline in social safety nets things like increase in Medicare co-pays uh, the fact that Social Security cost of living uh, hasn't adjusted with real uh, world costs a variety of reasons why social safety nets are not pr uh, protecting seniors uh, like they have so definitely a disturbing trend important to keep an eye on but all the more uh, all the more reason why it's important to make sure that you're saving for your own retirement in addition to trusting some of the more traditional things like pensions and uh, Social Security all right up next we're gonna be talking to Lynn Riley about the dangers of joint ownership you don't want to miss it stay with us Welcome back to the Money Pros. Joined now by our estate planning pro, Lynn Riley, attorney with Cameron and Middleman. Lynn, welcome back to the show. Great to see you. Great to see you, too. Uh, I think a really interesting uh, topic, and that is, uh, I, I titled it in my notes, The Perils of uh, Joint Ownership of Property, right? So um, we'll talk about what that property is and things like that. But I thought it was interesting uh, in preparing for the show, we talked over the phone, and one of the, you made a point to me about, um, uh, joint ownership and spouses and I want to give you an opportunity to kind of preface our conversation about the dangers of joint ownership we talk about spouses because a lot of people own property and joint ownership uh, joint name with their spouse and they might be freaking out like oh my god are we doing something wrong well it's it's not uncommon for spouses to own property jointly and it you know it, it um it, it means that they trust one another, and oftentimes it makes the management of finances much easier. Sure. But they do have to understand that that does mean that in the event that the relationship um, goes south, you know, it can be that jointly owned property is subject to uh, equitable distribution upon divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes the biggest disputes pertain pertaining to jointly owned property really is between um, persons that are unmarried. That has a little bit more um, potential uh, perils, but even so, married people don't doesn't give them the same opportunity for appropriate tax planning. Say, if they if they have everything jointly at home. So we're going to get into some of the perils here, but let's uh, perils and pitfalls. Uh, but let's talk about first of all what we're talking about uh, by joint ownership and by property. So uh, just what is joint ownership briefly and then what types of things was it, would it typically apply to? So we know what we're looking for here. Sure, almost anything can be jointly owned. So if you're talking about jointly owned bank accounts, if, you're, if you own an account and you put somebody else's name on the account, that new joint owner has equal access to the account the same as you. Equal access to write checks or to withdraw the funds from the account. Joint property, uh, same thing. If you own property and you add a person as a, as a joint owner, then you jointly own the property and all decisions pertaining to that real property must be jointly owned you know to sell the property and that can oftentimes lead to disputes between joint owners mm -hmm. so we're talking about real estate cars typically things with a title I guess or does it like would an antique or uh, you know a piece of art would that matter well I mean again it's easy to tell who owns a property if it's a titled piece of property mm -hmm. if it's not a titled piece of property it's more difficult to determine whose who's right it is right whose it is right exactly. okay so we have a slide we're gonna step through each of these points but these are essentially some of the problems and pitfalls that we can run into for joint ownership so let's put that up we're going to tackle these one at a time and first up we talk about creditors and matrimonial claims how can we get in trouble here if property is owned jointly uh, sure. So obviously, oftentimes it's very convenient to have um, an adult child's name on your account when you're an older person to help them pay your bills and so on and so forth. 
but if you have an adult child's name or an account and the child gets sued, you know, then what happens? I mean, if they become embroiled in divorce or if they owe money to the IRS, you know, you have issues. You know, basically their problems become your problems. So we see this a lot where somebody says, I, you know, I don't need to worry about a power of attorney or any of that. I'm just going to take my adult child. I'm going to make them a joint owner on my checking account. And if anything ever happens to me, then they can write checks and pay the bills. But you really run into some issues if the kid runs into issues in that scenario. That's what we're talking about here, right? Right. Your property becomes, becomes subject to their creditors and, and liens by their creditors. And also, quite frankly, one of the biggest drawbacks of having jointly owned property, especially between persons who are unmarried, is that you lose control over that property as the original owner. You know, you subject that account, for example, so to So that's misuse. number two. You're jumping yeah. ahead on oh, us here, sorry. Lynn. So next slide is loss of control, co-owner dispute. Right. So I think this is what you're heading for. So what are some of the things we could, the problems and some of the things we could potentially see or that you've actually seen? I've definitely seen it many, many times. Um, there's a lot of litigation over joint accounts. So misuse by the new joint owner, the withdrawal or draining of funds from an account, mm -hmm. and the misuse of those funds. Um, when you have jointly owned property, there can be disputes with respect to that jointly owned property. Um, if you want to sell the property, you've got to get the permission of the joint owner. If you put a child's name on your real property and they have creditors, that real property is now subject to their credit holders and could even lead to a forced sale of the property to satisfy their debts. So, you have lots of issues and you lose control with respect to when you add people's name to your property as a joint owner. And you, uh, you, we talk about in this, uh, this particular bullet point, co-owner disputes. So you get into, there's probably in most circumstances no legal agreement backing up the joint ownership. So you get into disputes of what you were authorized to use the money for. Oh, that was for grandma's care. I didn't you know, do that for my own benefit. And you get into, I'll say a little plug for the station, I'm an avid watcher of Judge Judy. <laughs> it seems like a lot of the disputes arise from these kind of, you know, we took all the money out of my bank account. Well, they didn't steal it per se, like rob the bank. They were on the account. They wrote checks. Right, it's not the bank's responsibility when you put another person's on the account who has equal who? access to right. the account. So uh, that, I think, leads us to our next bullet point, which is ambiguity. It's not always clear whose is whose or why things were done. Can you explain? Sure. So, I mean, again, oftentimes, let's say you add a child's name to your account for convenience purposes because they're helping you pay your bills, um, but no one really knows what your intent is. So let's say you have five children and you put your daughter's name in an account and you pass away. Did you intend all your accounts that have her name on it to pass to your daughter? Did you intend your daughter to share them with your other children or were they to the exclusion? of the other children. It can lead to really unintended consequences, hard feelings between family members. Oftentimes it can lead to legal action where another family member um, is suing the joint owner of the property. And we have joint ownership issues not only among family members, but say you have a joint account and you put an associate's name on the account and now the issue is, does that business associate supposed to get the funds in that account or is it supposed to come back to you? So there's lots of legal issues as to what you intended with respect to those assets, was it supposed to pass to the joint owner or was there another intention? Because if there's no overriding controlling legal document, whether it be a partnership agreement or some other understanding, um, it just leaves you ripe for argument, I guess. Um, number four, family complications. We've talked about a lot of family complications here, but are there more things that we need to be aware of as we think about joint ownership with family complications? Sure. So I'll give you, I, what I see oftentimes is say you have um, a person that come in and they have five children, they open five accounts. And each of the accounts have approximately the same amount of money, but then, you know, mom becomes ill. And so who, where do you pay, take the bills from? Which account do you take the bills from? Oftentimes it's the responsible child that takes it out of the account that their name is on with mom and dad. To, and then the money gets spent down. And then maybe the, the less responsible child gets funds upon mom's death and the responsible child gets nothing. Mm -hmm. So those are, that's an example of an unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes it would be better to have a financial durable power of attorney. If you became incapacitated, that agent becomes on, becomes, their name can be added to your account for convenience purposes. It's not subject to their creditors, but they can still pay your bills. And then your will and your trust can tell um, what happens to the disposition of your assets upon your debt so that everybody's treated fairly. So you have control during your lifetime. There's no real family disputes as to what your wishes really were because your trust document spells it out. And during your lifetime, 
we don't have um, those assets being subject to any joint owner's creditors because they're not a joint owner. Right. They're on your account as your agent. So is it, this is a broader question than joint ownership, but it strikes me as we have these conversations about estate planning, would you say a fair portion of the purpose of estate planning in general, proper planning, is to avoid a lot of these family complications? It, it, you know, people fight about money, and family fights about money maybe more intensely than anyone else. You find the estate planning, if done properly, can alleviate a lot of that? That's part of the legacy that you're leaving. Not only is it for making it clear what your intentions are with respect to the disposition of your assets upon death, but you know, to make sure that it's as seamless as possible and to avoid probate. A lot of people think, I have joint accounts, I'm going to avoid probate. But you have those unintended consequences as whether or not your children are all being treated fairly or your loved ones are being treated fairly. And even between spouses, if you have everything passing to a surviving uh, spouse, you don't have the proper tax planning if you live in a state like Rhode Island or Massachusetts as a so state debt tax. Let's throw the slide up and we're going to talk about the last two in succession if we can. So we have unintended consequences, and I don't know if we can bump up the next one, but uh, frustrate tax and succession planning scenarios. So we talked about the unintended consequences, and that seems to be a lot of this. You, you go into it with the best of intentions about what you want to happen, but because of the inflexibility of joint ownership and lack of detail, you run into problems. But one of those problems is you really me mess up some su succession planning and tax planning opportunities. Can you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Well, first I wanted to say that if you really don't have a taxable estate and you have just a few assets, you could add children's name as pay on death beneficiaries. And then with a financial durable power of attorney and a will, you know, you have your wishes clear and you don't have to, you know, the agents can be added to an account. You're not subjecting your assets to and joint nothing ownership. Nothing complicated or expensive about that. Right, we would like nothing. to point out, right? So that if you don't have a taxable estate and you have modest assets, you know, think about adding pay on death beneficiaries as opposed to adding them as joint owners. Mm -hmm. If you have um, assets, you live in mass, and your assets, you and your spouse's assets combined, are greater than a million dollars, which with respect to real estate and life insurance, retirement accounts, is easy to get up there. In Rhode Island, it's a little bit north of 1.5 million. If you have everything passing to the surviving joint owner, then the exemption amount of the first spouse to die is being thrown away. You're not using it. You're not planning appropriately. And when the surviving spouse dies, if they die with assets greater than that exemption amount, a million for a Massachusetts, about 1.5 million in Rhode Island, you're going to be paying a state debt tax. With proper planning, you can double that exemption so that you're, you're protecting $3.2 million of assets safer in Rhode Island or $2 million of assets in Massachusetts. And you can avoid probate and you can avoid all these other pitfalls. So oftentimes by having the convenience of jointly held assets can basically undermine not only your intentions, but you know, making sure that the most that can get down to your next generation without having the government take a piece of it in taxes. So I'll have to make that the last word, but in addition to cr potentially creating all kinds of problems with family, you could end up uh, coughing up a lot more of your estate to the state government in particular, maybe the federal government, but likely the state government, uh, that you don't have to if, if you had done proper planning. That's correct. That's Lynn, perfect. valuable information as always. Now I'm like terrified of all my joint accounts. We're going to have to go back and visit that. All right, uh, up next we're going to be talking about America's uh, world's really first trillion dollar uh, company. So stay with us. There's more to come. Welcome back to The Money Pros. An important milestone that I think it's worth uh, touching uh, on here on The Money Pros is uh, the fact that the first company in history uh, has uh, hit a one trillion T trillion dollar uh, market capitalization and that company is Apple Incorporated maker of the iPhone and Apple computers and all of those things that you and your kids and my kids uh, adore uh, the so let's talk about what market cap is if you take uh, total up the value of all the outstanding stock of a company, that's its market capitalization. So the total value of all the outstanding stock. And earlier this month, Apple hit uh, the $1 trillion uh, milestone. It was the first company uh, to ever do that. So I thought it was worth taking a look at a graph of the uh, exponential growth of Apple stock over the past about 12 years. So let's throw up that graph if we can. And this graph goes back to January of 2006. And the reason that that date is significant is that that was when the very first iPhone was released. Now at this point, Steve Jobs had rejoined the company uh, and the company was doing substantially better than it had done in the uh, late 90s. 
Uh, but this is really where Apple stock exploded. And since January of 2000 stock, Apple, uh, since January of two, uh, 2006, Apple stock is up 1,823%. A $10,000 investment in Apple stock in January of 2006 would be worth uh, over $200,000 uh, today. So that is a significant uh, rise. Uh, the success, as I mentioned earlier, has really been propelled uh, by the iPhone, which of course the first iPhone was released uh, under Steve Jobs, um, you know, sort of epic uh, run as CEO of Apple when he was brought back. Uh, and what's interesting is many analysts were worried that with Steve Jobs passing, uh, Apple was not going to be able to maintain uh, the growth. But under uh, Tim Cook, uh, who's the new CEO, they seem like they dress the same, it's hard to really tell, but uh, he has been able to continue the growth through a succession primarily of new iPhones as well as the expansion of Apple into markets that have represented even more explosive growth than here in the United States, particularly in China where they've opened up that market and has been a significant uh, contributor. Um, it's important to note that the run-up in Apple stock is really emblematic over the past decade of a run-up in tech stocks in general. In fact, we've talked about here on the show, I talk often uh, with clients about the acronym FANG stocks. FANG stands for Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Uh, those uh, companies uh, have contributed significantly to the run-up in the S&P uh, over the past uh, decade uh, as we've seen an explosion in tech stock growth. In fact, as outstanding as the growth in uh, Apple has been, it really pales in comparison uh, to the growth of Amazon over that same time period. Amazon's founder, Jeff Bezos, is now the richest man in the world uh, on the strength of Amazon stock, which has seen even more stratospheric growth. Maybe we'll take a look at that in another uh, segment of The Money Pros. All right, thanks for uh, watching. We're going to tell you how you can ask us a question. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Folks, if you've got a question for The Money Pros, I hope you can ask us. You can uh, do that in three different ways. You can visit The Money Pros uh, Facebook page and uh, post a question there or private messages. Uh, you can also visit foxprovidence.com Dot com, click on the Money Pros and click on the button to ask the pros. And you can also send me an email, moneypros at foxprovidence.com. As always, we answer all of our questions, even if we don't do it on the air. But a lot of times we do it on the air. So take advantage of the pros, ask us a question, and we'll be sure to answer it one way or another. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next weekend right here on the Money Pros.